the morning after a late Penn State football game. That's what you're experiencing here today. But we're so grateful to have people also joining us online today, and it is a great day to be in church. I want to draw uh, your attention to a few of the announcements that are, well, first I'm going to share this with you. We, we are still accepting today donations to the Historic Paradise Church Cemetery Association, which the basket is sitting there. But I wanted to remind you about these uh, are our special Sunday offering envelopes. Next Sunday is World Communion Sunday, and the offerings for World Communion Sunday go to support education uh, for ministry. So if you would like to give a gift of support for World Communion Sunday, just grab one of these special uh, envelopes. A special Sunday envelope is near the bulletins there, and bring it back next Sunday. Also, we have on our schedule this week, Thursday morning, well, I'm actually going to start with the bigger picture here, Fall Hay Riding Picnic next Sunday. Uh, in case you didn't know, it's raining, and it's likely to do that much of the day. So we decided we would much prefer to use the rain date of next Sunday, because I'm sure it'll be a much better day. Uh, same times as uh, you see there in the schedule. Thursday morning, we have ladies' coffee and conversation, and that's for open to all the ladies in the valley, 9.30 here Thursday morning. We've got uh, next Sunday, our special guest, Pastor Michael Stein, will be here. And uh, now, be nice to him because he hasn't preached in weeks, right? Months. months. Oh my goodness! So you know, so take it easy on him next week. <laughs> but we're so grateful for you being here next week. Uh, and also, we have on our schedule here some opportunities for learning. We've got uh, lady workshops and a refresher innovation, different opportunities there. Please look those over, and if you'd like to participate, I highly encourage that you do. We have the opportunity to meet our new bishop, and since uh, he knows that sometimes we struggle with his last names, uh, he Bishop Hector is fine. So you can meet Bishop Hector on the 15th from 6.30 to 8 at Faith in Belfont, and it's just going to be a very informal kind of get-together, no registration required for that. And then you can see down there, October 29th is our church conference. That's going to be held 6.30, I think it's a Tuesday night. Yes, and it will be yeah, Tuesday night at Faith in Spring Mills. It starts at 6.30, we will start promptly. So if you want to come earlier, that's highly recommended to pick up your uh, to pick up your conference booklet. There is a sign-up sheet that she's getting there. If you know that you're going to be attending, you will need a conference booklet. So we want to make sure we kind of have a tighter number so we don't end up with a whole lot more or not enough than we need that night. So if you could just let us know that you plan to attend, we'll make sure that we have a booklet there for you. Are there any other announcements to share this morning? Then seeing that, I want to draw your attention to our centering words today. What are you living for? Living a good life means being on this earth for a reason. Please rise with that as we prepare our hearts for worship by singing together the sanctuary song. Please turn in your hymnal to number 117. 
as we sing together our opening hymn, O God, our help in ages past. Heavenly Father, there are many prayers on our hearts today, those spoken out loud and in the silence. You call us to be salt in the world, to add some flavor and some savor to your world. We cannot be bland witnesses to your love, only working when it's convenient for us or doing work that is incomplete. If we lose our saltiness, it cannot be regained. So we ask you to give us courage and joy in our service to you, encouraging others who are in service too. Help us to be people who clear the pathways to service rather than those who place roadblocks or potholes in which people may, might stumble. Because many are called to serve you, Lord. And so help us to be people who work willingly with others, not demanding our own way is the only way, but 
seeking your way, rejoicing in the new thing that you are always doing, especially when it's a new approach to ministry. You give us confidence and joy in all that we do when we offer our lives and our prayers to you. You call us to be a people that pray, and so let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now that we have uh, reconciled ourselves to God, let us rise and pass the peace of Christ with one another. And as we make our way back to our seats, we'll prepare to hear the word and the word proclaimed by singing together while remaining seated. Our hymn of preparation, a, ch a charge to keep I have, number 413. into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. In our second passage from James chapter five is an urging for the early church to pray 
to pray for those who are sick, to care for the unity of their church together. You know, it's interesting because then as now, uniting around Christ brings people together who would otherwise not be together in the same room. People who might all week long travel in different parts of the city, but they come together around Christ. And unity around Christ is a very different kind of unity. So hear the words of James 5, 13 to 20. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. In our final passage, which is where we're really going to linger with the message, we, we hear of Esther. I would highly encourage you to read the story of Esther when you have time this week, because there's a lot leading up to this few passages that you're going to hear, this one passage rather. And it's important to hear it from the standpoint of understanding what it was like for women at her time. We tend to hear about Esther and we think of her in modern terms. We think of her like, well, that's an empowered, independent woman. Eh. Life was just not like that for women. You really had to be very cautious and careful about what you said, who you said it to, how you said it, when you said it. And even though she was queen, her title was given to her. Her position was aided by God. And if you think about that in terms of Joseph in the Old Testament, he had many titles. He was a prisoner, and God yet raised him up. He was a servant of Potiphar, and God helped to raise him in position. So with that, it's important to understand she was really risking a great deal but she understood there was a reason to. So with all of that, I read to you now from the book of Esther. Chapter seven, verses one through six. Now the king and Haman came to drink wine with Esther the queen, and the king said to Esther on the second day, also, as they drank their wine at the banquet, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you, and what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom it shall be done. Then Queen Esther replied, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me as my petition, and my people as my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Now, if we had only been sold as slaves, men and women, I would have remained silent, for the trouble would not be commensurate with the annoyance to the king. Then King Ahasuerus asked Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he? Who would presume to do thus? Esther said, A foe and an enemy. Is this wicked Haman? Then Haman became terrified before the king and queen. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. 
Then Mordecai recorded these events, continuing on in verse 20. And he sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to celebrate the 14th day of the month Adar, and the 15th day of the same month annually, because on those days the Jews rid themselves of their enemies. And it was a month which was turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and rejoicing and sending portions of food to one another and gifts to the poor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The story of Esther is a great one, and I highly encourage any one of you to read it again and again and again, because as I said, at the times, if you read it in context, it puts it in a different light. Esther is a young Hebrew woman whose parents or grandparents are taken in exile in Persia, and after her parents' deaths, she lives with Uncle Mordecai. He's a palace official and an aide to the most powerful leader in her part of the world, the king, who chooses Esther of all the women in the land to be his queen. There's just something about her he finds favor with. So the title is given her, yes, but she is actually raised up to one of the highest positions in the land. She's building up trust with the king but one of the king's advisors hates the Jews. He's irritated with Mordecai and he wants to get rid of all of them. So he hatches a plan. And so does Mordecai. And he brings in Esther, who at first really can't see how in the world a woman could have any impact here. And in the end, it, she, it is by revealing at precisely the right moment, which is why I say, go back and read what happens before chapter 7. At just the right moment, she reveals her nationality to the king and begs for the lives of her people. And that results in Haman, who wanted her people dead, to be executed. Two people with a cause only one was good. All the readings speak together about different aspects of how we go about the work for a good cause. In the Gospel reading from Mark, we see Jesus warning the disciples not to prevent others from doing good in his name, simply because they weren't on your team, or your team wouldn't be getting credit, or whatever was driving all of that. When the disciples tell Jesus someone was casting out demons in his name but was not part of their group, he responds, do not stop him, for whoever is not against us is for us. Which is true. Jesus' words remind us that God's kingdom is built by those who work for good regardless of their status or their background or who they think they are. I may not know them, but God knows them. It's really hard when you're called to do something, and that's a deeply personal thing, and someone says, I can't see you doing that. It's prevented more than one person from answering a call to ministry. Well, they didn't call them. <laughs> if God can see them in ministry, that's all that matters, right? Like Esther, the key is not our, not our title, but our dedication to the cause that aligns with God's will, and that's the most important part. Jesus goes about emphasizing the seriousness of leading others astray. So you tell me that you're having difficulty with someone casting out demons in my name. And you would want to prevent that. Why? So he starts to use this powerful imagery about removing anything that causes us to sin. That causes us to go down a wrong road, right? I call it seeing the squirrel. You're trucking along and then you go, squirrel. If it's your hand, if it's your eye, if it's your foot, you're better off without that squirrel. And it challenges us to align our lives fully with God's cause that we're pursuing because fully means hearts, hands, and feet that might be involved in anything that's distracting us from this good cause 
We are called to remove it from our lives because then and only then can our lives be fully aligned with the good cause. You know, it's interesting because Jesus didn't just flip a switch and make all of the disciples perfect. Did you notice that? That was a great illustration of how God works. Did you ever pray for patience? Did God flip on your patience switch? No, but I bet he gave you an opportunity to practice. And I have the, I have the feeling that these disciples are going to have an opportunity to practice what he is teaching over and over again. In the book of James, we heard about praying for one another in a good cause being absolutely essential. He's reminding us whether we're suffering, joyful, or sick, we pray. We turn to God in prayer. That, <clears throat> that work matters, whether it's a ministry or our daily lives. It requires us to stay connected to God and to one another. And it may not be something that we set out to do that day, that we find ourselves doing a different kind of squirrel. I went to uh, the post office on Thursday morning and there was this new person there. I'd never seen him before. He was all alone. Usually there are like two or three people in there. And behind him I saw carts, plural, three, heaped over. He apologized because he gave me my package and he said, I'm sorry if you have anything else. I, I've not been able to get to this. I've been answering the phones. And he was new. He hadn't even been trained yet. But he was all that they had until one o'clock. He said, one, help is coming at one. And I said, wow, that's got to be really tough. And he, I said, you're going to need a lot of caffeine. And he held up his little can of caffeinated water or whatever it was. He said, yeah, I'm out. It was 1030 in the morning. So I said, I have the feeling you're going to be okay. I think it's going to be okay. And I dashed off to Duncan, grabbed him a large coffee and a breakfast sandwich and took it back and put it on the counter and said, Power up, you got this. And his whole countenance changed. Now, I didn't necessarily plan on running to Duncan. I was actually going the opposite direction. That was my plan. But God will give us a call in a moment to, to change something for someone else. And it might be something you would never expect yourself to do. Because I, there was a time I would have thought, you know, I really ought to go do that. I'd say, that's crazy. I've got something else. I'm going the opposite direction. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. But this is how I remain connected to God and connected to other people. I found that when I pray more, I'm more receptive to that, and I'm also more able to say yes where I used to say no. And that's because uniting around Christ is very different than any other kind of unity. If, if they're is anything that we've learned in today's culture and society when we talk about coming together as anything? No one you elect is going to do that for you. That's not how this works. And unity around Christ is very different because you will see in churches people with all different kinds of ideologies and political sway, persuasions getting together in one room People who may not see each other at all during the week because they go in different places in the city where that letter would have been going. They would not see them in they don't, not in their, their circles. But in the time that they're together for worship, they're together and united in Christ and Christ alone. All the other details will work themselves out if they're united in Christ. In Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, He's speaking about this kind of unity that is necessary. It's not optional. It's necessary. But I want to go to Paul's letter in Galatia, chapter 3, verses 23 to 29, to speak to this specifically. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you, are, if you belong to Christ, 
then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. That's family. And family is family no matter what. This passage doesn't say a thing about taking away your identities or saying all of a sudden these things don't exist. Yes, Jews and Greeks exist. But it's talking about we are one. This is we are one language. The list brings together a title for someone that counts with someone that doesn't count, saying, these things don't matter anymore, not here. Don't even bring them up. But it's really hard to get over thinking about certain titles the way Jesus wants us to. And some think that being a follower of Christ means you're just gonna get over it like flipping that switch. And boom, you're gonna see everybody and everything the way Jesus did. No, no we won't, because we've still got the same brain, the same heart, the same eyes, the same ears, and the same heart. And unless we are really focusing on changing that heart first, we aren't gonna see the difference. It takes time and honest effort and a boatload of humility to see others the way Christ sees them. Because we've been sold a lie for so long that's straight out of the devil's playbook, and it's this, if it's good for me to do, it'll feel good to do. Is that true? No. I had to deal with a very irate person last weekend who was just 100% angry, making a demand now. And I said, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna take care of it immediately. Thank you for letting me know. Other people, I could tell their response was gonna be different because they were getting a backup. But in that moment, the only thing that person needed was kindness. She did not need a piece of my mind. She needed a different kind of peace, the peace of knowing this request, which actually was not that big a deal, would be met. It wasn't that big a deal. Now, sometimes we'll look at a situation like that and think, well, she's very irate for no real good reason. That's true. Probably because this isn't really what she's angry about. And I don't know this person well enough to know what's at the heart of that anger. But I can actually diffuse this with kindness. That's not natural and it doesn't feel good to be yelled at, does it? But do you think Esther was having the time of her life knowing that this advisor to the king, very close to the king, wants her and her people dead? Was she having a good time? Did it feel good to know this thing and not be able to just blurt it out to her husband? She had to go about it the right way, at the right time, with the right words. In fact, she, knew, she understood how important it was to be prepared. She asked for prayer and fasting. If you go back to Esther chapter 4, you'll see there was a lot of preparation for this. She wanted them to help her, pray her up so that she could have strength and wisdom to face the king. Because let's face it, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. We know that sometimes people in a position of authority with all that power, he had a little anger problem. Did you hear that at the end? His anger subsided. The title queen was given to her, but the position she was in was a gift from God. It came with it responsibilities that defined the work that she was able to do, but it also helped her understand what kind of help she's going to need. Because the fact of the matter is she could not save her people on her own. She needed help. And sometimes the help comes in the form that the passage from James talks about, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So Esther's courage was combined with this divine help. So it was not merely and only limited to human effort. And when we're engaged in a good cause, God's power accompanies our work, multiplying its effectiveness. 
Like, I look at the soup sale on Thursday night as God multiplying our effectiveness. We had what we needed when we needed it. We had no real hiccup in a good time, in good outcome. Esther's story teaches that we're all called to a good cause, wherever it is that we are. No matter where we find ourselves in life, we may feel powerless, we might think it's too much, or we may feel insignificant or too small, or not enough, and that's because we need each other. We need God's help, we need each other's help. We may be given a title by others, that we didn't necessarily give to ourselves, like suddenly we're the ones responsible or we're the ones responsible for the, uh, for, the for fixing it. And we'll sit there stymied going, oh, I, didn't, I didn't sign up for this today. Like last weekend. <laughs> I didn't sign up for that, but it was like, well, uh, no, but I was nominated by God in that moment to be addressing that situation. It's the position of being able to understand what my responsibility is in that moment and to be able to connect with the people needed to help what needed to happen, happen and happen quickly. And it did. What could have become a much larger issue didn't. And it was a good thing. It didn't feel good, but it was a good thing. Excellence happens for the glory of God when we are able to remember what our responsibilities are. Not just to have a title of Christian or Christ follower, but to have the position of one who is able to pray and ask God for what we need. Even when we aren't even sure what it is that we need. Sometimes just to know what we need. Esther's story teaches that we're all called to a good cause and that we might feel powerless or insignificant, but just as she discovered her purpose and her position, so can we. Whether it's in our professional work or our personal lives, when we commit ourselves to something that matters, that really, truly matters. Because let's face it, there are people arguing about lots of things that just don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. But when we focus on the things that really matter and align with God's will, we become part of his greater plan. Let us pray. Lord, like Esther, may we rise to the occasion for which you called us. Strengthen us to pursue good causes, to work for justice, and to act in all things in love. Empower us to live lives of meaning, even when it's difficult, knowing that even the smallest act of kindness done in your name matters. Guide our hearts, hands, and feet to align with your purpose even when we don't feel like it. And may we, like Esther, find courage in the knowledge that you are with us, always pulling us toward work that will accomplish your will. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Would you please rise in body or in spirit to sing together our closing hymn, number 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
find peace to serve the Lord. Remember the healing love that has taken place in your life. Be open to all the wonders and opportunities that God puts before you. Go in peace and know that God goes with you. Amen. Thank you.